Hi and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for Game of Thrones Season 8, Episode 3, The Long Night. This video is a part of a series of videos where I review episodes of Game of Thrones. So I'll have to start with a spoiler warning for Game of Thrones. Up to Season 8, Episode 3, if you haven't seen up to this point, you will not want to watch this video. Otherwise, some things will be spoiled for you. So this was a pretty exciting episode. Most people loved it. Some people hated it. I'm leaning more towards liking it, but it wasn't perfect. I wouldn't say this episode was badly directed. I think they made conscious choice to make it uh, have dark lighting and cinematography that focused more on close-ups rather than long shots. I just don't agree with that choice. There are some beautiful shots in this episode uh, as uh, is usually associated with battle episodes and particularly associated with uh, director Miguel Shapoknik in particular, but a lot of it was too dark and hard to follow. The second time I watched it, I turned the brightness on my TV all the way up pretty much, and I heard a lot of people saying that that's what they had to do, and honestly, I enjoyed the episode better on the rewatch as I was able to follow it better and catch uh, more of some of these small hints of what's actually going on. And I did find it a really enthralling episode. I particularly liked the ending, which I thought was beautiful. So let's jump into the episode, uh, starting with the build up to the battle. So we get a sequence with Sam walking through the castle uh, as everyone prepares for battle and some dude tells him to move and then we see Tyrion preparing to go to the crypts and he looks over to Theon and the Ironborn who are escorting Bran out to the Godswood and he almost looks like he's a bit jealous. Now, the first time I watched this episode, I didn't care much for this scene as I just wanted them to get to the point as we spent the entire last episode setting up for the battle. Uh, the last thing I wanted was more build-up. But on a rewatch, I appreciated the scene more, the quiet simplicity, and I do like how there wasn't much dialogue except for Ed saying, For fuck's sake! Now, Melisandre shows up, which I thought was kind of out of nowhere, kind of convenient. I felt <laughs> that, uh, I feel that uh, seasons one through five of Game of Thrones would have explained where she was and would have earned her turning up all of a sudden here, where this felt more like season seven of Game of Thrones era, where people just turn up wherever the plot requires them. But whatever. So she lights the Dothraki swords on fire and they go charging towards the White Army. And not to my surprise, the lights all start to go out. Uh, which of course they did. I think this is a really stupid move to send the Dothraki out like that far away from the rest of the forces. I mean, what did they think was going to happen? Did they think the Dothraki weren't going to win the day and single-handedly defeat the White Walkers? No? Well, that means they all die! <laughs> I mean, if they were back with everyone else, it seems like they could have done a lot more good. Anyway, then we see Danny and John perched up on their dragons, uh, watching this sort of off to the side. And on the inside of the episode, Dan and Dave confirmed that Danny and John were supposed to just sit there and wait until the Night King goes after Bran, but when Danny sees the Dothraki dying, she feels the need to do something to save them because she feels like they're her children. So first of all, by the time she sees the Dothraki, they're all dead at this point, so there's no point in leaving now. Secondly, if she didn't want all the Dothraki to die, maybe she should have come up with a better battle plan and not such a stupid plan that was guaranteed to get them all killed. Again, what was she thinking was going to happen? It seems to me that this was just plot contrivance uh, in order to get Danny and John into play, but whatever. So after uh, that, Jorah and the few surviving Dothraki come back and we get the start of the actual battle as the Whites collide with our fighters. And there were some things I liked about this, some I didn't. Again, the dark lighting really works against their favor here as the Whites don't seem like a realistic fighting force but rather a cartoonish ball of CGI-ness. 
uh, so it was hard for me to get invested. The better moments are the more close-up fights between individual characters taking on whites that we can see clearly. I like how one of the veiled dudes just took off and ran away. Totally reasonable when you see a gigantic horde of zombies charging towards you. And then, of course, Brienne responding by yelling everyone to stay on the ground, uh, which is totally true to her character. And we get a few scenes of her and Jamie fighting and looking out for each other, so that was a nice touch. Uh, then Sam almost bites it, uh, but Dollar Zed saves him only to be killed himself. It's kind of a cliche when someone saves a coward in battle and then they just get killed immediately. But whatever, I actually liked his death. I heard the complaint that this came too soon and it uh, didn't mean that much. But I liked how we got a named character dying this early. It raises the stakes and sort of spreads out the misery throughout the episode. So I thought it worked. Uh, but after the battle, after that, the battle boys zone for a bit. Uh, they realize that they're getting overwhelmed, and they call for a retreat. And boy, I bet they wish that they had some Dothraki cavalry just about now with flaming swords in order to help them out. Too bad they just threw them away for no reason. Anyway, I like how Grey Worm and the Unsullied particularly uh, uses their shields and spears to protect the retreat. It reminds me of how renowned... Uh, the Ansali were, and they're said to be able to stand against any army, even a Dothraki one. So it was cool to see them holding back the whites as everyone retreats. We also get a few shots of Danny and John flying the dragons and uh, dousing the whites in Dragonfire. Now, in Dragonfire. Now, although these shots look beautiful and were cool to see, I have some issues with how uh, it doesn't seem to slow the whites down at all. I mean, you know, these are like huge swaths of dragon fire, and the whites are established to be vulnerable to fire. I understand that their numbers are so big that the dragon fire isn't going to defeat them outright, but it should at least slow them down. There should be some like lulls in the attack that allow the fighters a bit of time to rest and prepare. It kind of makes the dragons feel inconsequential because that doesn't there doesn't seem to be any consequence to their actions. Anyway, the Night King does think the dragons are a problem though because he brings in a huge storm that blinds them and uh, Danny and John and they can't see so they can't see the help. I think we spent a bit too much time with John and Danny just flying around blind. I think they made their point. We didn't need to spend that much time with them but I did like how the two dragons crashed into each other. That illustrated how blind they were. So Davos gives the signal to uh, the dragons to light up the trenches, but of course, uh, Danny and John can't see that because they're blinded. So Grey Worm uh, sees Melisandre just standing around, and because I guess he saw her light up the Dothraki swords earlier, he knows that she can light the trenches. So a group of Unsullied escort her out to the trenches so she can set them on fire, which I did think was pretty cool. Uh, this allowed uh, Danny and John to find their way back uh, to Winterfell. However, once they're inside the castle, they find that they're not exactly safe. I love how once the Whites uh, saw that they couldn't get beyond the barrier, they just uh, stood still and waited. And uh, then we see Bran use his warging abilities to warg into some ravens where he sees the Night King kind of controlling the Whites, kind of like a composer waving his arms. And uh, the Whites then start charging at the flame, uh, flaming trenches and sacrifice themselves to create a barrier for the other Whites to climb over. Then they start storming Winterfell and climbing up the walls, World War Z style. Or at least so I'm told, I never actually saw that movie. And then we get uh, battle scenes of people like Gendry and Jamie fighting off the Whites as they climb into the castle. And that was pretty cool. And then we see the Hound sort of cowered out, kind of like he did at Blackwater, but here he's just kind of giving up, thinking that there's no way they can win uh, against the dead, and Beric uh, brings him out of it by pointing to Arya and saying, well, tell her that, and this is enough to snap him out of it. I love that. First of all, it highlights what a badass Arya is, is being, and also shows how much the Hound still cares about her, uh, as he can tell that she's in trouble. But then we get this horror-type scene 
uh, with Arya like hiding in the library uh, from the whites and I gotta say I didn't really like this I this felt too much like a too much of a dramatic shift in tone uh, from a huge battle uh, all of a sudden uh, we're taking 10 minute break to do a horror movie and then back to the battle also after how big of a badass Arya was being in the battle earlier, it seemed that a character to just suddenly be terrified by the Whites. Now, I understand that she was overwhelmed by them and that she would have died if she just fought them straight out and she couldn't fight them by herself. I understand that. But I think they overplayed how terrified she was in order to artificially turn up the horror element. And so it just felt like contrived. They just wanted to throw a horror movie in the middle of this battle episode. But that's just me. What I did like, however, was Leanna Mormont's death. Uh, that was pretty badass uh, when the giant uh, just swiped her away like she was nothing. I was upset because I thought... That's how she died, which I thought would be a punk-ass way for such a badass character to die. But to my delight, the writers knew better and had her go out like a boss as she stabbed a giant who was trying to eat her in the eye. Perfect send-off to this character, in my opinion. Now, I heard the opinion that this was cheap fan service, and boy, howdy, I could not possibly disagree with that more this was a fitting end to a badass character anything less would be short changing the story and would in fact be bad writing and we also got uh, the dragon battle where Drogon and Rhaegar take on the Night King and his undead dragon and as much as I hated the ice dragon in season 7 I got to admit I enjoyed this sequence it was pretty intense with Rhaegar and the undead Viserion clawing at each other uh, as the Night King tried to throw his spear and attack Jon and then Drogon showed up to save the day but then he had to retreat because the Night King tries to throw his spear that killed Viserion in the first place. Uh, he misses, so I guess Dr. Colossus has to give up his gold medal that he won at the White Walker Olympics. Oh, poor him. <laughs> so, we also saw uh, Sansa and Tyrion in the crypts, and I like the interaction between these two when Sansa tells Tyrion uh, he was the best of her husband, and Tyrion says, oh, what a terrifying thought. But, really, it's not that high of a bar considering her other two husbands were literally the worst two men in all Westeros. But then she says it will never work between them because his devotion to the Dragon Queen is a problem. Now, some are suggesting this is implying Tyrion and Sansa will get back together, and I do think it's possible. But that line was really sudden out of the blue if they do get back together. So if they get back together, there needs to be a lot more build-up to them getting back together. But I like Masande's response to Sansa saying the Dragon Queen is a problem, saying, oh yeah, she wouldn't, uh, she, if she wasn't here, there wouldn't be a problem because you'd all be dead. And frankly, I think she's got a really good point. So I hope this uh, will impact Sansa going forward and she won't be so hostile to Daenerys and a little more grateful that she helped them not only save their lives but all of humanity as well because there's no possible way no possible way that they could have defeated the Night King or the White Walkers without her and her dragons and her Unsullied and her, well, I guess the Dothraki were useless but at least the other, <laughs> the other two were helpful so then, we see the Hound and Beric uh, save Arya. Uh, in particular, Beric sacrifices himself to save Arya as he would be dead. Uh, she would be dead without him uh, as he literally picks her up and uh, takes, you know, takes her in the, out of harm's way and holds back the whites as he uh, gets stabbed like shitloads of times. And then they hide in the room where Melisandre already is, and she explains that the Lord of Light kept Beric alive uh, so that uh, he could save Arya's life. And now that he's done that, he can rest, so he promptly dies. So that's a really fascinating concept and probably the best end they could have had for this character, who was never really that important. He like, disappeared for like three seasons. So I liked it. And then Melisandre and Arya reminisce about what she said to her about putting how she put out many eyes. They mentioned the colors, brown eyes, green eyes, but Melisandre puts particular emphasis on blue eyes 
sort of implying the White Walkers, because they have blue eyes. And I gotta say, no way is that what she meant originally when they first did this scene in Season 3. Because many people have blue eyes. Hell, she could have meant that uh, Arya was meant to kill Torment. But I did like how Melisandre asked her, uh, what do we say to the God of Death? And she answered by saying, not today. It's kind of like when Melisandre said, you know nothing, Jon Snow, to Jon in Season 5, quoting the, an important line that she couldn't possibly know about. But in this case, uh, the God of Death could most certainly refer to the Night King rather than her own death. So it takes on new meaning rather than it being about staying alive. It's about killing the Night King. And I loved it. And I think it works so well. So outside, we see Daenerys go up and try to kill the Night King uh, with dragon fire, And it straight up doesn't work. Seems like Bran should have seen this coming, but whatever. And this makes sense, because although fire has been uh, shown to be very effective against whites, in the past, fire has done nothing to the White Walkers, and to the Night King in particular, who could just simply step right through fire. However, what I really didn't like is how Dr. Colossus, <coughs> I mean the Night King, had an evil smirk on his face after he survived the fire. I'm sorry, but that is dumb. That is really fucking cartoonish. But I did like how uh, you know, John, we saw John charging towards the Night King and he responded by raising all the dead the people who had just died in the battle. That was super intense. And plus it seems like John was completely screwed until Danny uh, showed up and saved the day with Dragonfire. And it does seem like the battle uh, was almost won against the Whites until the Night King just uh, used all of their own fallen soldiers against them. Uh, so that's pretty fucked up. But then we go back to the crypts and see that the dead start to rise from the crypts and kill the women and children hiding there. And I'm sorry, I did not like this scene at all. In fact, it really pissed me off. First of all, why would John and the others be so obtuse and so idiotic uh, to send women, helpless women and children to hide in the crypts when they know that the Night King is capable of raising the dead. Uh, so yeah, let's put them in a room with a bunch of dead. That's very smart. <laughs> and secondly, I don't need to see women and children killed by zombies, especially when it only happens because our heroes are being colossally stupid. So no, just no. I did, however, like how uh, Drogon was overwhelmed with whites, and I seriously feared for Drogon. I thought that this would be the end of him, but he saved himself by flying away, but that left Danny there trapped, but thankfully Jorah was there to save her, which made perfect sense for his character, and uh, it was set up for, as you saw, Jorah uh, moving towards her when he heard the dragons. I guess he thought that she might need his help, and turns out he was right. And it was really cool to see uh, them standing alone, fighting off whites together. And then we get a really cool sequence of John running through Winterfell, although it isn't all one shot, and it isn't quite as cool as some of the previous epic shots in episodes like Battle of the Bastards and Watchers on the Wall, but still a really cool sequence as he glances over and sees a lot of familiar faces still fighting. He sees Gendry and Tormund on a hill of dead bodies fighting off whites. Uh, Sam lying on the ground stabbing whites trying to kill him. And Grey Worm still alive and kicking. And uh, Brienne, Jamie, and Podrick are all backed against the wall just fighting off whites like crazy. And he's trying to get to the Godswood to protect Bran. Uh, so he keeps running but he gets cornered by a white dragon who's really fucking things up. And again I thought this was a pretty cool scene. Now, in the crypts, we see Tyrion and Sansa hold hands as people around them die. That was cool, uh, possibly setting up for a romance, but in the moment, it was more of them coming to terms with the fact that they were about to die. But they eventually hide somewhere with Varys and a few others. And then Theon uh, with Bran was really nice, has uh, he and the Ironborn fight off the Whites with Aerys. And we got a scene earlier where Theon tries to apologize to Bran, but he says, everything you've done has brought you to where you are now, home. And I think that line is very powerful. As first off, it shows that Theon's real home is Winterfell, and also, 
it is saying not to regret the past because it always leads you to where you need to be. And also, I think the line applies to a lot of people, not just Theon. It could also very much apply to Arya, uh, who's had a tough life, but apparently it was all for a reason to bring her here to this point with this particular skill set. So, we then get this ending sequence that I absolutely love uh, that's set to piano music. It reminds me a lot of the blowing up the sept sequence from the Winds of Winter and I honestly think it's just as good and it's what really saved the episode for me. I love how we got a montage of seeing how fucked all the characters are as the music plays. We see Theon die. We see John cornered by a white dragon and every attempt he makes to kill it fails. We see Jorah get stabbed a shitload of times as he and Danny are surrounded by whites and pretty much fucked. We see Tyrion and Sansa cowering in the crypts where they're pretty much fucked as well. And of course the slow walk up of the Night King to kill Bran and how Bran just sits there and stares at him. However, I will say seeing the White Walkers in slow motion felt kind of cliche, badass scene. I was half expecting to hear like the Reservoir Dogs theme play over as the cool White Walkers just walk down slow motion like dun 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 But we did get some beautiful shots of Bran just you know, just staring at the Night King as he approaches. And the shot we got uh, when he uh, reaches for his sword, but we see Arya come up out of nowhere flying at him was an absolutely beautiful shot. The shot uh, it was amazing. It was just really well shot. And even though the Night King grabs her, she drops her Valerian steel blade and stabs him in the chest. Kind of a nice callback to when she was training with Brienne. Uh, when Brienne uh, bested her up top, but down below she sneakily had her with her dagger. Now, I know a lot of people had a problem with Arya killing the Night King, but I didn't, to be perfectly frank. Uh, this seemed like a really cool way for the Night King to go, as uh, someone uh, like Danny and John would be too obvious. And Arya makes practical sense, uh, because no one uh, was shown to be more stealthy uh, than Arya, so it makes sense only she would be able to sneak up on the Night King unnoticed. And I did like the foreshadowing with Melisandre asking her, what do we say to the God of Death? It felt right, it felt earned. Uh, so, uh, as was set up for in the previous season, uh, when the Borg Queen dies, all her drones die as well. Uh, so we get a triumphant defeat of the White Walkers, and all the Whites they just disintegrate, and we see Melisandre coming out of hiding, and Davos goes to kill her, but uh, he doesn't have to because she just takes off her necklace and just walks in the snow and dies. Uh, because she served her purpose and she has nothing else to live for. So <laughs> that was an effectively spooky way uh, to end the episode. So now let me get into some of my thoughts on the fact that the Night King and the White Walkers were defeated in this episode when we still have three episodes left, as I totally was not expecting that. I was expecting them to win and to continue south, but you know, I don't really have a problem with that. If season seven never happened and this was coming, I was coming off of like season five or season six, I'd be massively disappointed as I was expecting the final battle with the White Walkers to be a lot more drawn out and coming with several huge revelations. They were bringing a lot more to the Night King. But after season seven, I think the show jumped the shark with the White Walkers many times. So frankly, the sooner they're gone, the better as far as I'm concerned. I like that this episode was short and sweet, and I like how uh, little we saw of the fan service dragon uh, this season, because the less the better, that's for damn sure. And now we can just focus on what the show's always been about, about politics, about humanity, and how it relates to themselves, and, and uh, you know, how the little-minded people can be playing the Game of Thrones, and I imagine that uh, the battle with the White Walkers would have changed things drastically in those regards. And plus, I kind of come to realize that if the White Walkers were ever to make it as far south as King's Landing, humanity would have already lost. Most of Westeros would be gone, because I think the show has made it pretty clear that the White Walkers do not leave any survivors uh, behind as they go. Their whole goal is to kill absolutely everyone 
that they come across. So if they didn't lose the battle here at Winterfell, then there's no way anyone would have survived the battle. I mean, every single main character uh, would be dead. And I didn't really want that. So uh, <laughs> I'm okay with them killing the Night King at this point in the stage. Kind of feels like they had to. Now, as far as the deaths go, and we didn't get very many deaths. There were only six and I was expecting a lot more, and it was mostly side characters who weren't that important in the first place, like Dollar Sad, Beric Darian, Melisandre, and Lyanna Mormont, and the two exceptions being Theon and Jorah, but even they weren't that huge. So I'm going to reserve judgment on that. Um, I'm also going to reserve judgment on whether or not the next three episodes will suck. I can see a scenario where they do, and I can see a scenario where they don't. If it ends with John and, and uh, Daenerys defeating the evil Cersei and getting married and ruling on the throne happily ever after, then yeah, that will suck. But I'm not convinced that will happen. Uh, there's been a lot of implications for, from actors and people that the, the ending is very dark and it's gonna a lot of people are going to be crying. And uh, I think someone in particular said the next three episodes are going to be even darker. Uh, so that makes me optimistic that we're going to get a fucked up twisted ending, which would be more true to Game of Thrones, but I guess we'll see. Anyway, my rating for The Long Night out of 10 is a 9 excellent. Uh, I was so close to giving this episode an 8, but that ending sequence alone knocks this up to a 9 for me. That sequence was so beautiful. So amazing, but the whole episode wasn't perfect. Sure, it had its moments. Some were super intense and satisfying from a character perspective, while others not so much. And, uh, you know, the cinematography was too dark and too confusing and hard to follow, or we got really cheesy moments like the Night King smirking and the whole whites raising in the crypts because the characters were being morons, which I didn't really care for. But. This was still a really good episode, not the best. I still prefer Battle of the Bastards and uh, Battle of Blackwater and Hard Home as far as battle episodes go, but definitely an exciting and worthwhile episode. So that is it for my review of The Long Night. I will be back here next week uh, to review the next episode of Game of Thrones, so be sure to check that out. Also check out my channel for many more videos and other shows like Star Trek The Expanse, Lost, and more. So be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all that, and thanks a lot for watching.